Headroom uh, was the voice of Pink Panther. And uh, so we tried to get him. We had the license. MGM was playing nice. Universal was playing nice and giving us all the stuff. And so we couldn't use a theme. So we had to redo the theme and make it sound like da 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 instead of da 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 whatever. Um, and Matt Brewer wanted like a quarter of a million dollars to record the game, and we were like, oh, we're a tiny startup in New York, Silicon Alley, so we can't afford that. <laughs> so um, we were trying to find voice matches, and we auditioned all these people, and then the other guy who was the, the, the music lead was like, dude, just put yourself on the tape. And I was like, oh, that's weird, isn't it? It's like, no, no, I mean, like, you're, you're an actor, whatever. You went to the fancy college for acting. So I, I did my little Matt Frew impression under a different name, and then, then my boss called me and said, who's Michael Tremaine? And I was like, oh, crap, that's me. So I had to do it, but we did it at the end. I was already on salary, so they paid me very little to do it additionally, because they're like, you're on payroll. Um, so I got a little bit of it, like a tiny hourly. But I did two days in a row of 12-hour sessions. Two 12-hour uh, days. How? That's so <laughs> Yeah, but it's not like doing, you know, like, ah, Gears of War or anything, which okay. is good. But it was all, eh, obnoxious voice. Hello, kids. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not my favorite voice to do in the world, but uh, there were 12 hours on one day and then 12 hours the following day. The second day of 12 hours was the first. My fall out. <laughs> I was young then. Next up. Uh, What's the main uh, difference between doing an audition for, say, uh, the anime versus the voice acting version of video games? Video. The, uh, the auditions, what's the difference between doing an audition for a video game versus uh, an anime? I've never auditioned. I've either, my, I think Chris Abbott gave me the part of Onion and, um, <laughs> no, no. yeah, I didn't know that would become later an anime character, um, but there was no audition, it was like, you can do a little boy voice, but usually it's, if the show I was on does a game, <laughs> and I look out, so I have no idea about. Mm. Please do tell. Essentially the same. I mean, I there's the there's more non-disclosure. Oh yeah, lots more paperwork to fill out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I've got some auditions that I've submitted now for my agent, and I can't even submit the audition. I'm eating again until <laughs> until I, I fax back a non-disclosure signed executed agreement. I'm like, it's on my iPhone. Come on, I can't write on my uh. <laughs> So secretive, so secretive that they'll even have like fake names for stuff, different character names. Yeah, yeah. So you don't know like, oh, Jill Valentine, that's Resident Evil. No, they'll be like, Brenda Parfignugan. Like, <laughs> 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 Brenda Easter, that's a good name. Uh, yes. Yes. Have you, any of you uh, found yourself typecast for a certain type of game? Like if you call your voice for like, like Well, to a certain extent, we're all typecast in everything we do. I mean, uh, for, for the longest time, I, I did nothing but young heroes, you know. And then uh, I, I stopped. I stopped voice acting for a while. When I came back, you know, Johnny Bosch and Harry Lowenthal had shown up, and I couldn't do the young heroes anymore. So now I'm kind of typecast as a as a higher voiced older dad, you know. So, but that's great because that gets me work. So I'm happy to be typecast. When I first started out, I was doing a lot of really like the really squeaky little girls. It was um, always like the little tiny girls. But now it's, it's changed. I, I got to do more in my range. I mean, my normal voice. Yeah. And even deeper. does some deeper work. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm typecast as a mom or a little boy, usually. <laughs> Again, because I've already had the role. <laughs> The truth is, is that if, if you have an, a genre that's really active and you can get typecast as something, it's not as artistically satisfying, but it keeps you employed. It gets you in so, the booth. Yeah, it gets you in the booth. That's good. And I found, for me with games, it's been a little bit less so because when I do, for instance with anime, like it usually the way the business sort of trickles down, um, a studio will get titles, you know? And then if you work with them, the same people will be like, oh, that guy who did this here. And different companies will type you with different things sometimes. Like, there was one place that thought I did, I mean, usually I'd like kids, either heroes or nerds, but, um, but this one place thought I was like, 
like a deeper <laughs> hero guy, which I don't think I sound like at all. But um, they, they would bring me in for that stuff, and I was like, cool. Oh, there's some kids here. You don't want to, no, 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 you're playing the tough guy. I was like, only here, buddy. <laughs> it's totally fun to, 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 yeah, or bad guys. Like, I, when I finally got to do some bad guys, I was like, ooh, this is a whole different thing. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, so usually, like, the companies will typecast you because they work with you and they get used to you. But with video games, it's a lot of different people, and everyone's, like, jumping ship and going to the next place, and sometimes, like, well, now I was a Sega, now I'm a THQ, now I'm at Microsoft, and, you know, it, it, it gets confused and blurred. So, less so for me on games. It, it has been helpful that an awful lot of uh, uh, people coming up in the game development world were now kind of getting in charge of stuff. We're all anime fans growing up. That's really been helpful for us. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Next. Uh, oh, way in the back. Uh, how did companies normally find us? Like, you work for multiple companies or just one? How do they find us? Well, we all, yeah, we all work for different people. We're all independent business people, independent actors, so we all work for different companies, whoever calls us. Sometimes they put out breakdowns and agents send you, sometimes they just call you up or they know you and say, come audition for this or that. Um, as directors, we tend to work for a single company. I don't know about you, but, but you know, in, in LA, it seems that each studio has their pet directors. So, and, and so that's, that's kind of how that works. There's just like two places in Dallas, <laughs> so it's pretty much Overtron and Funimation, so they know where to fuck me. <laughs> Reputation does help. So. Uh, yes, it is. Depends on my mood. <laughs> um, it, look, as an actor, I, I love acting. It's where I come from. It's where I started. I started as a stage actor. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's really my heart and soul and what, what really drew me into this business. And I, and I really enjoy it. Um, as a director, I have a measure of bigger creative control. So my, my performer side loves the acting. My storyteller side loves the directing side because that's what the director does. What is your ego like? My ego likes the directing because they get paid more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You also have so much more control over the entire thing as a director. I mean, as an actor, you need to bring something, of course, but you also have to be simple to what the director's doing because only the director knows the context. He's the boss of you, literally. <laughs> it's your job to make the director happy. You're not the boss. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, potentially more artistically satisfying because there's more creative control. Um, but I find, especially if I'm directing a ton, man, as soon as someone puts me in their booth, I'm like, I don't have to worry about how it sounds or what's going on. I can just like be loose and do a thing and then be told to you know do something else. And, and the nice thing about acting in any capacity is escaping yourself, taking a vacation from being you. I mean, I mean, even if you're awesome, it's nice to be something else. <laughs> Extra awesome. <laughs> right here. As actors, do you all ever have any like crazy demands for the people that you're working for? Like, for example, you need to have a bowl of like green M&Ms or water imported from this country or whatever. Prussian. Oh, well, look, um, <laughs> did you guys hear the question, by the way? All right, do we have any crazy demands like a bowl of green M&Ms? Do we have any <laughs> crazy demands? Uh, voice actors? <laughs> um, look, the bottom line is we're voice actors. It's voices. Not Van Halen. No one knows what we look like. We're really replaceable. <laughs> People who have those kind of diva demands don't last very long because there's no there's no attachment. I require an occasional potty break and some water. Yeah. Well, they feed it themselves. Really. Yeah. So not, not really, and they don't last long if they do. Yeah, it's like chewing, so I thought I'd talk again. Oh. <laughs> the um that the, the the green M and M thing actually came up. Um, for me coming here, they're like, well, do you, what do you require to be a guest at CyberCon? What's your green M&M clause? And do you know, anyone know where that came from, the green M&Ms? No. Yeah. All right. Oh, you, you knew, I knew. Um, so, you guys just like text each other while <laughs> As I understand, I think Van Halen, uh, it was sort of a Van Halen story. And um, when, when bands go on tour, they have these long riders, and uh, the riders like, we need this, 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 the stage has to be like this, the lights have to be like this, the union crews, blah, 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 blah. And so what they would do is, because these writers are so long and boring, they'd show up and be like, I don't think they did the stuff in the writer. Um, and it could be a safety concern, because like, if they didn't do the risers right, then the stage could fall. And in the 80s, with pyrotechnics, someone's head could catch on fire, like Michael Jackson on the Pepsi commercial. No, that was breaking his neck and spinning. No, that was, that was the kid from 
Will Smith show. Anyway, yes. Um, Alfonso. Alfonso Ribeiro. 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 Um, so anyway, so what they would do is they would say all these things for safety reasons and only green M and M's in the you know green room. Um, and so they'd show up in the green room and be like, all right, if we don't see green M and M's, they didn't execute the, the writer. So that was a really easy way to check if they didn't read the writer and executed stuff like they should. I mean, it seems silly, but you know, if they had done it because they were told Van Halen wants this, then they're like, oh, fine, whatever, Divas. Then they would show up and go, okay, then we can trust that they took care of the stage. Not that Eddie Van Halen needs only green M&M. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it came from. I, just mm -hmm. I like that story. That's a good story. <laughs> good story. Yeah. You're welcome. It's never fully secure. Um, and it's not one company. In order to have a career, especially as an actor, you have to have a network of companies, uh, a network of people, and, and, and you know relationships with other actors and other directors and, and people like that in order to maintain enough. Because not everybody works all the time, so you, know, you have to jump from place to place. Um, I, I don't think I've ever, as an actor, I don't think I've ever felt secure. As a director, a little bit more, just because I have a relationship with a company. Uh, and even even then, with, with Bang Zoom, I know that I do ninety percent of my directing with them, and it was several years before I kind of felt settled. And even then, sometimes I go, well, "You still like me?" <laughs> We're balls of insecurity here. All right, yes. I started on the stage doing musicals, so, uh, but, but trying to do musicals in Los Angeles on the stage, you can't really make a living in it. Uh, I had limited, I had very little to no success on camera, I did three or four movies and I just sucked in them. <laughs> um, and then found voice acting, so that's where I started. And the, the stage work has been the most important. Uh, for me, theater. Theater's huge. I mean, in terms of voice control, uh, all the things that go into being a stage actor, except for the movement, uh, are really helpful for, for voice acting. And, uh, oh, hi, Doctor Who. Sorry. <laughs> I like Doctor Who. Sorry, guy. Just don't get a name. Nice start. I think that um, for any form of acting, for me, improv has been the most. Most auditions are so. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I. That's huge. And I, it took a, I wish I had taken improv first before a lot of other things, because almost all auditions are you know, pretty on the fly. Yeah, I was going to say improv, too. That was a big one. Really you was. were going to say mine. I was gonna, also going to say mine, but no one will remember that. See, <laughs> that one, that one uh, but thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I would say uh, theater, of course, theater training is the, uh, the core, the root of, of really, I mean, that is, that is acting, of course, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I would say improv within doing that because, as you said, the audition process and even sometimes the so recording process itself requires some uh, some improvisation, some ad libbing. So uh, that way, you can't be as easily thrown by whatever is given to you. You gotta. Well, just the uh, auditioning is a whole other art than acting. It's like I'm I suck at auditioning. If if I get a role, yeah. I can feel good. <laughs> He's been witness to some of my worst, it's but it's like good. it's a whole other <laughs> art. And so I mean. You take all the acting lessons, but you got to get the job, and so that's sort of why my little answer was it. Oh. Cynthia just handed me this mic back. I don't uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, uh, right there. No, go on. <laughs> Showing again? Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, um, it's interesting. There's a debate um, in the industry about whether you want to hire people from like audio school or people who just sort of 
intern for a while, don't get paid. I mean, you have to work for free anyway when you start in a studio for the, for the most part, unless you have a vast experience and you come with like Emmys. Um, but, <laughs> um, I started in North Carolina when I heard about these anime auditions and I was, I lost my mind. I was like, they're doing writing bean? I know what that is. All the actors in town were like, what's a writing bean? Is it a food? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome red car. He's like bulletproof, but he's not magic. I don't know. And um, he's not really bulletproof, he's just badass. But, um, so I, I got a job there and I, I was so into my agent, uh, God bless her. She uh, actually sort of browbeat the owner of the studio into like letting me work there. For free, I mean, but she was like, oh, let him work there, we're not hiring. Oh, just let him work there, we don't need anyone. Oh, yeah, let the kid just hang out and work there. And ultimately she beat him down. Um, so I got to work there. And, but the reason was, also, I, I was in a theater company, I knew all the people in town. It was a music studio trying to do anime, they didn't know how to speak actor or who the actors were. So I could like suggest, oh, you need this older guy, and this great old Scottish guy who would be perfect for this like butler part, whatever. And um, so I bring people in, and um, I spoke actors, so they trained me to run the board, so that during the session, the director, who's a wonderful singer, songwriter, guitar player, could say to me, they're not doing what I want. You know what I want them to do. What do I say? And I would say, try saying this. So he would say that, and then they would do it. Um, and they wanted me to start making coffee there, but I was so crap at it that they, they moved me off of that in two days. <laughs> so you probably you will just have to go somewhere. I mean, you need some kind of experience knowing something about digital audio. Uh, now analog is sort of not relevant, but there's a lot of things about digital audio that are important, like clock stuff, sync stuff, and, um, and basically knowing Pro Tools now. And you can get certified to run Pro Tools, but even if someone comes to my studio and says, I'm a certified Pro Tools engineer, I'll be like, well, you don't know our workflow. So anywhere you go, they're gonna have to train you still, so expect to work for free for a little while, and then maybe you'll work up. But uh, try to look like someone who thinks ahead, because most of the people that come through my door who want a job are just like, uh, I know how to push buttons, tell me which buttons to push. And I'm like, you know what, I need you to be someone who thinks. You know, and like goes, oh, if I just keep doing this while well, something bad is about to happen, then something bad will happen. How about like recognizing what's coming ahead or having context? Just seem like someone who thinks, and that will be huge because anyone can be trained to do stuff. Um, also, having ears, uh, like knowing how to hear things, but that's a whole other conversation. And yeah. don't push random buttons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Um, have you ever gotten to be able to do like a vocal logo, like, you know, IBM has bum, bum, bum. Have you been able to get a commercial job like that? Commercials? Uh, uh, I, I've done, I did it for Fox a little bit. Uh, you know, Fox Kids will be right back after this. <laughs> <laughs> Some weird ones like a talking car and a car commercial and... I auditioned for something, it turned out to be like the Anime USA commercial where I was like this anime character and uh, just little things like that, but nothing like huge. Dallas is mainly a commercial market oh. and, and my thing is, I'm again usually the mom but I'm, or the corporate lady, but I'm either on the commercial and not talking or just my voice on anime and no one sees me. I've yet to really do both at the same time. <laughs> 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 I Actually, my, friend, my best friend from high school and my best man and he got the ultimate one job like that for about 10 years he did this next on HBO oh, for about wow. 10 years he was now like the voice of CBS Sports and all that stuff big time New York you might know Sam Montana oh oh he was my best man <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, but he, he got the ultimate he got the That's ultimate awesome. logo job which is cool about himself an apartment on the other west side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a cheap neighborhood. Here's a trivia question. Uh, this is not about me, of course, but uh, you know the beginning of um, uh, any Funimation that you hear? Funimation. You should be. Yeah. Do, does anyone know? There's a male and female voice saying Funimation together. Does anyone know who that is? Is that one of them? No. What? Uh, sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it was uh, Colin oh. Beard and Rob McCollum. Oh, oh. Wow. Well, that's a little Interesting. Oh, I got it. Oh, wow. I, did, I did a dog for Nickelodeon. Um, uh, my studio, we were doing sound design for Nickelodeon's first feature film, which was a Rugrats movie. And um, uh, a friend of mine who I knew from, from animation in New York did a stop motion dog. You see like clouds, a tree, and the dog goes <laughs> and looks at the camera and it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and 
then, um, you remember? <laughs> okay, so I sound designed the whole thing, and there's only so many recorded dogs you can get, right? So I put all these things in, a bunch of alts, because commercial people want to hear like different things, and they speak like, I mean, it sounds a little ridiculous to say now, but they're like, we want more, um, we want more searching for the dog. We want the dog to have more, more angst. We want the dog to have more anguish. We want the dog to have more. Give a little more orange. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, no, I love it. That'll make me hate it. Um, so, um, Pretty much. So they're doing all these things. They're expounding on the inner workings of this dog's soul. And I was like, I'm out of dogs, guys. Uh, then I was like, okay, but but you know, you gotta satisfy your clients. So you're not like, oh, just make up your minds, guys. You know. So I was like, okay, that's great. So I'm combining things and editing things on the fly. And they're like, mm, we still want more of an excitement, a curious digging for the truth out of the dog. So I was like, okay, uh, you hit these two buttons. And I just jump in the booth and I start going like. <laughs> And uh, they were like, oh, good, good, good. Yeah, more excitement, more, more juggling. And I'm like, more. And then, uh, I ended up the dog for the Nickelodeon features. <laughs> All right, uh, we are out of time. So thank you very much. Um,